experts of all stripes. So not only climate modelers, and I'll try to speak on the panel to climate modeling concerns, um, but paleoclimatologists, um, you know, air, air quality researchers, atmospheric chemists, et cetera. Um, yeah, and then I also work on, on algorithm design on, on the pure machine learning side. So I'm uh, David John Gagne. I'm currently a machine learning scientist here at NCAR. Uh, I got my uh, PhD at the University of Oklahoma working with uh, Amy McGovern. Uh, my research focus has kind of been on machine learning for high impact weather prediction. So I've done a lot of work with uh, hail, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, and more recently kind of got into the parameterization problem. So how do we, so, so a lot of work before was post-processing. How, how do we translate model predictions into like, uh, or model output into actionable predictions that are calibrated and, and more accurate than, than the raw model output? But the, the big challenge now is actually how do we put the machine learning back into the numerical model and either accelerate the model or make it better? Uh, and that's what my talk this afternoon will be about. Outside of that, I'm, I'm also, I've been involved with the, with both climate informatics, uh, with like helping co-chair some of their hackathons past, uh, past a uh, couple years. And then uh, I'm chairing the AMS AI for Environmental Science Conference uh, in Boston in January. Uh, everyone should, uh, should come to that. We're, we're going to have, a, it's going to be the biggest one ever. So, that, so that'll be, it'll be quite exciting. Uh, and yeah, so, so those are kind of my areas. Hi, uh, my name's David Hall, and uh, my background's kind of complicated. I started with theoretical physics, and then I stuck with computational fluid dynamics from my, my dissertation topic. And then I sort of blended over into atmosphere model development, which I did for a while. Um, and then I got into artificial intelligence and joined NVIDIA. I worked at Los Alamos National Lab for a while. I worked at National Center for Atmospheric Research here over in Tower B. I was a research professor in computer science at CU. And uh, now I'm a senior solution architect at NVIDIA. And what that means is that currently in my current position, I help people get started with their deep learning projects. So I collaborate with lots of uh, people in national labs, at academic institutions. And I travel around a lot talking about deep learning, artificial intelligence techniques, and how you can use them on GPUs. So that's me in a nutshell. Thank you. Or, oh. <laughs> I was going to say, you could come forward you? slightly. Yeah. You don't have to hand it to me. You can okay. hang on to it. <laughs> All right, so uh, to kick things off, um, what do you see as the greatest opportunities for machine learning methods to augment physically based methods? All right, I'll start. You've already had some of my perspective in the talk earlier, but I'm excited about the idea of removing bottlenecks in existing models by using surrogate models or new parameterizations to accelerate models that we know are large sources of uncertainty or large sources of computational expense. Um, so I guess that would fall under emulators, which was another thing I was gonna mention, and David has worked extensively on um, emulators for physical processes. When I first started talking to climate modelers, I really thought there was a lot of room for machine learning actually under the hood of a climate model. I thought maybe, you know, since um, each, each dynamical system is so sensitive to its parameters, um, and those at one point were learned from some data or estimated from some observations, maybe machine learning could help to get higher confidence estimates of these physical parameters. Um, at the time, um, I was told that, no, they're about as well understood as gravity. That's not where we need help. Um, machine learning could also help maybe um, just improve the confidence on the estimates of data that's input as initial conditions. Um, and then, again, I don't think climate modelers were interested in that, but it, it, still, it still could be possible. What I understand the biggest need from climate modelers is um, parameterization. So 
how do we get all the cloud modelers that are you know modeling clouds actually integrating these moist processes into earth system models, et cetera. Um, and machine learning may, may play a role there. And it might be along the lines of what you mentioned, should I? So when you talk about parameterizations, one of the things that I think of is are studies that come from a lot of small, diverse data sets. So maybe a lot of field studies run at multiple scales, integrating multiple different types of data, perhaps dealing with a, a small and geographically sparse number of data points. Do you have any thoughts on whether machine learning can unite some of those different data sources or, or bring those together? Um, actually, that's a really good point. So data fusion um, and sort of unsupervised learning from multiple forms of data is, is actually a promising area in machine learning. I've used it more to improve forecasts. So for example, hurricane, forecast, uh, hurricane track and intensity forecast where you can look at storm locations, so just track data that's, that's available from NOAA, um, in addition to geospatial fields of relevant meteorological variables. Um, but there's no reason that couldn't be done um, also for you know, NWP or Earth System model uh, predictions as well. Yeah, I, I think with the, the upper, I, I agree that parameterizations are a big um, opportunity for uh, the, the, for machine learning to be integrated into the models. And I think it also presents some really interesting challenges that you may not see as much or to the same degree as you might uh, with, with some of the existing kind of big machine learning problems that people like to attack, like your image nets uh, type, type problems. And one of them is basically being able to ha have a model that, a machine learning model that can operate in different climates. Um, so it's, for some processes, like the they're fairly constrained, so you're not you're not necessarily going to be uh, like like if you're suddenly going to like global warming scenario, it's it, it shouldn't change all that much. But there are a lot of ones that do, and some in very in subtle but important ways. Uh, the climate system, the climate models and weather models are tightly coupled across all the components. So the error that one problem I've been running into, I'll talk about in my talk a little bit, is that. You, you might get really high accuracy or R squared or whatever, what you think is high accuracy uh, for a problem, but then you run it in a different climate and suddenly uh, it'll run for a while and then some other part, not, not your part will, will break, but some other part of the model will suddenly break and that'll break the rest of the model. Uh, and there's like, just because the system is so tightly coupled, it's a it's an interesting opportunity, but it's also a really big challenge to to get the system to work. And in Millie, it's not and it's not just a modeling problem. We we do see this uh, in in various other domains, like say YouTube's uh, uh, recommendation engine. Uh, causing people to suddenly become radicalized about all kinds of different issues uh, because it's it's optimizing on one metric, but but then it's tightly it's coupled to the people in a, in a kind of an unpredictable, uh, less under understood way. So I have a kind of different perspective on this question. Um, my perspective has been changing over time the longer I work on this stuff, and right now what I'm uh, most excited about is a concept called differentiable programs. So the deep learning algorithms and things that I'll be talking about and other people will be talking about are sort of a um, example of a differentiable program, which is probably better called a learnable or trainable program, in which some of the part of your program is learned directly from data. So you code up some of it, and then you learn most of it. And you know, so a neural network is just a bunch of really simple functions that are then trained from data, and you adjust all the parameters. But on the other end, you could write um, you know, a fluid dynamic solver where everything is known except for maybe one parameter, like the effective viscosity. And you could learn that by looking at the data and just fitting that to it. So there's a whole spectrum in between where some of the code is written in the forward technique, and some is basically reverse engineered from data, and you meet in the middle to create a, a solution. So. Uh, deep learning is just sort of the tip of the iceberg with what you can do with this in the modeling area. Uh, and it's sort of the first example of a differentiable, learnable program. And I think these two techniques are going to blend over time and allow you to, to really take the best advantage of each. 
So, um, yeah, I, I would say that's probably, in my opinion, the place where there's the most potential for uh, combining this sort of thing with traditional programming or modeling. So, yeah, we have a question back here. More comment, really. There was a, an excellent workshop on machine learning in weather and climate at Oxford at the beginning of the month. I know a number of people here were at that meeting. And Professor Tim Palmer, in the opening presentation, um, referred to a spectrum of usage of, of a a AI and, and machine learning, going from soft AI at one end to hard AI at the other end. I think he was making a humorous reference to hard and soft Brexit, but we, we don't want to go down that route. Um, so at the soft end, the machine learning is just used to help in developing pram parameterizations. And at the hard end, you throw away the numerical model completely and, and produce your weather forecast using mach machine learning. Rather like in the old days when people used to look over weather, weather, weather maps and try to spot trends and, and that, that kind of thing. I, th I think that's what um, David was alluding to, that, that, that there is this, this, this spectrum. And probably the, the, the best route is to, is to combine the, the best of numerical modeling with the best of, of machine learning in, in some kind of mid middle ground. Yeah. Um, but it's clear that there is a lot of work going in on right across this, this spectrum from soft to hard. Yeah. yeah, so that's pretty closely related to the next question that I had in mind, which was what kinds of components, are there components that we think we understand and that machine learning methods could potentially advance or replace? Are there topics where probably what we're doing is sort of the right way to do it, and the advances won't come out of the machine learning world. And so maybe you could um, comment in either direction on this. Sure. I, th I think it would be helpful, too, if you could reference some work that you think is leading in this area, your, your best example for, uh, for, for the uh, question that Jed had. I, I, someone was ref referenced this morning, uh, Gentine and so forth, but maybe if you could provide your best example. Oh, I had a comment to the question that does not have a reference. Um, so I'll leave that to somebody else. Um, I think we should zoom down on the variables that the models are the worst at predicting in terms of lack of disagreement or high variability, whether it be, um, you know, the sensitivity that we see to aerosol or, um, you know, the lack of skill in precipitation pred prediction. That said, and Jed and I have been having discussions about this, um, like at what point is the natural var variability large enough that we cannot, you know, appropriately model it even given, you know, infinite compute. So I think it's, I think it's, it's a challenging. Th those, the areas that we have the most uncertainty might not be the ones um, that machine learning will be able to shed light because even if we have high, highly granular data, um, there might be just so much natural variability or variance in it. Yeah, I let's see. I get my thoughts together on this. I, I do agree that I don't think machine learning is going to replace the entire numerical modeling system. There's just it, it come as different fundamental assumptions that come from kind of an inductive reasoning perspective, where you basically, as you get more examples, uh, you eventually you 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 should converge towards something that represents most of your distribution. Uh, but sometimes there's some problems where, especially with the climate system, where we're not going to be able to see every single possible state. But for for parts of it where we can see enough of it, I think machine learning can have, where we have the data to, to capture the, the, the broad spectrum of it, I think machine learning has a lot of role to play there. Uh, there's a lot of problems, as, as Claire just mentioned, uh, so uh, where the our, our current modeling of it is very, very empirical. There aren't 
nice equations that, that describe things or there's not or or the equations are under constrained in some way so you have to come up with some closure or or, or whatever and so turbulence uh, boundary layer problems uh, uh, s s some of those areas I think are, there's a lot there's a lot of room to, to try try to include some machine learning uh, acceleration um, where, where I think it's going to be a, a challenge uh, or, or where I think there is a risk, and I think something that that people sh need to be thinking about more is, it's easy to to build a, a big d deep neural network, and we have lots of tools to do that now. But if you want to run this in a climate model, you don't unless you have access to Summit or or some of these giant supercomputers. Even in those cases, the you might build a machine learning model that is way more accurate than your numerical model, but the machine learning model is more, much more computationally intensive just in the number of operations it's going to do. It's not going to scale well, and it's going, and it won't be feasible as an operational system. So we need to think about kind of the, 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 but the power budget and, oper and like, operate, uh, like the flops budget of our, of our machine learning models when we're trying to put them into our climate, climate s s simulations. So I would, I would question that because the training is expensive, but what people like about it is once you have the model, you can just do a feed forward prediction. That's not that expensive. Well, I mean, but I mean, it, it's gonna be a function of how many weights you have in terms of memory, but. Yeah, I, I mean, for, for like a, a dense neural network, yeah, the, the, the inference is not expensive, but then if you're putting ResNet 50 or ResNet 100 or some of these other, the, the like image recognition type models, uh, some of those can get very, even in inference mode can be quite expensive. So, so it's, or, or, or you're adding other dependencies into the system where if you have to call TensorFlow or, or you're calling other big libraries, it, it's, it's something to consider and, and be aware of as you're, as you're building these systems, I think. Uh, yeah, I would avoid having a product like TensorFlow or PyTorch in your operational forecast. I would encourage writing your code in like C++ or something um, more effective. Actually, my I have a student doing a startup on this. I think Kelly has had her hand out for a while. <laughs> a few different points. I, I was going to generalize from what David John was saying and uh, say that I think about these decisions in terms of cost accuracy trade-offs. And these are decisions that come up in modeling a lot already in terms of things like mesh resolution and how many parameters we include and to what order we calculate those parameters. And a lot of the advances we're seeing now with machine learning are exciting in the sense that they create an entirely new paradigm with very different cost accuracy trade-offs. And these work well for some problems and not so well for others but just by creating an option that can be orders of magnitude different from the options that we already have on a select set of problems that creates a lot of leverage. And just to give some examples, um, I think the cloud convection example by Gentine that was mentioned earlier is a great positive example because cloud convection is very computationally intense to model accurately using traditional partial differential equation techniques and we're able to get a much better cost using machine learning. In contrast, I think doing something similar with say ice flow models or ocean dynamics would probably be much less effective because the natural timescales for those systems are much longer and it's it's and they're modeled well by existing PDE equations with relatively little dynamical uncertainty. And so there's not enough, as much leverage and not as much possible gain. Uh, generally, I agree with what everyone said so far. Um, you can break down your climate model or weather model into various pieces, dynamics, physics. With the weather model, you have data assimilation. Each of these pieces, you can think of deep learning or AI in general as helping you either replace that piece with something that's a little bit simpler and a lot faster, or you can try and improve that piece by learning directly from data. You can potentially, you know, it's harder to improve upon the dynamics because a lot of people put a lot of time into that and it's, it's pretty well understood. So there, there's these sorts of things where you can improve the model in, in a known way. But 
Um, I think one of the more interesting things is the ability to do something new. And that's a little bit more uncertain, and it'll take some time for people to figure out how to use these tools in ways that no one's ever used them before. I mean, predicting the, the weather climate is, is basically uh, involves chaos, and you're, you can't really predict far into the future. But maybe you could do something like predicting the, uh, the attractor instead, you know, things like that, stable, stable attractors uh, directly from data, things that you wouldn't have tried to code up by hand. I don't actually have a good example of all the things people will be able to do with these tools in the future because they're new. So that's, I think, yeah. So we've discussed pretty well what you can do with existing techniques, but I think there'll be other things that will evolve over time that I can't really speak to right now. So I've heard people talk about problems when you um, do the emulation and you replace something with something more accurate, but then the compensating errors that were in your model um, get messed up. Are there ways to deal with compensating errors with, between a neural network model and a traditional, like in, in a full model that has multiple sub-models? I'm betting David wants to answer this. Uh, I mean, part of it involves what what parameterization developers have already been, have been doing since time immemorial and basically running it in a less complex, like in a simpler mode and and tuning it somehow, or either like switching different parameters, adding more diffusion, whatever switches they, they, they do to, to figure out what the compensating errors are and get them to work. The challenge is that it's a lot harder to do that with it's easier to do that with code that's already written out and has certain knobs that are already that are kind of set there. A neural network, you don't have, it's, it's a lot less straightforward. There are things you can do, but it may involve retraining the model or changing the hyperparameters. So, so there, there's some stuff you can do. I'm still working through that process. So I don't have a, the, this is how you solve it yet because I haven't solved it yet. But, um, but a lot of it, uh, I, I think when, when, one challenge I put out to the modeling people out here is basically making the models a little more m modular and diagnosable as you're as you're running them uh, to be able to ferret out exactly what are all the different inputs and outputs to all these pieces so that we can see like where where is the error growth going on in the model and and, and is there a way to easily extract that and easily test have have some kind of testing frameworks and other stuff and make them well documented and accessible to the machine learning developer people, so that we can we don't have to wait a, a, a week or a month for for Kalima modeling people to to come back and be like, oh yeah, I ran it and then it blew up, uh, and then I, I make a change, retrain in a couple days, and then a month later, oh, it blew up again. So it's uh, the the turnaround cycle needs to be much faster in order to make real progress on a lot of this stuff. Okay, I don't have a specific answer to that, but I think it's a good opportunity to plug Rebecca Morrison's talk. She works on uncertainty quantification from physical models and will be speaking at three on Friday in the CU Applied Math Colloquium if you're still in Boulder that day. Um, and she's been publishing at machine learning conferences, so I think she's kind of at the interface of machine learning and UQ. I don't know too much about it, and I'm excited for the talk. Yeah. So um, I, I think a, a part of this gets at this question of tall versus wide data. And so it, there's at least two ways in which data can be big. So big, we can you know, say petabytes of data is big. Probably most people agree petabytes of data is fairly big. Um, but it could be that you have, say, a single climate trajectory of a high resolution run over 100 years. Or you could have lots and lots of realizations of a relatively small regional model run at high resolution, and then maybe you have thousands or a million examples. And uh, different methods in machine learning may be appropriate in those different regimes, but part of this turnaround time question is, can we have more tall data than really wide data? And yet I think there's an interesting question looking at balance of, um, say if we want a balanced climate that's going to behave in a, um, a realistic way over say a hundred year time period, can we do that from tall data or do we need to somehow handle wide data? Maybe you have further thoughts on that.
Yeah, well, one thing I've I, I, one of the questions I commonly get is how much data do you need for your machine learning mo model, and and sometimes I think how much is not necessarily the 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 right answer because you could have like as you mentioned like say petabytes or terabytes of data, but it may be from one high resolution run in one climate scenario, one climate trajectory. But if you want something, a machine learning model is going to be able to generalize well across different climate trajectories. The best way we currently know how to do that is you need kind of the wider option. You need to have runs that, that, that occupy a wide part of the space so that the machine learning model can interpolate in there more effectively. Uh, and, and and so so it's not so I guess how much is it's like what what's your diversity what's your coverage, uh, and unfortunately I don't know what a good coverage metric is because we're dealing with really high dimensional spaces and uh, that that often have all kinds of different nooks and crannies in them that 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 can lead to various edge cases that that can cause problems, so so some of it I think is going to it's just not like one solution that's going to easily solve everything, but I, I think this were a challenge to, to kind of the climate and the computer science field to come together to come up with ways we can better like mathematically define it or scientifically define these, the, the spaces we need to cover for, for, for these systems to basically set where our goalposts are so that we know when we're succeeding. So um, supervised learning techniques like deep learning and other machine learning techniques are are basically a type of curve fitting, which is, you know, sometimes people use that to be disparaging, it's just curve fitting, that's dumb. Other times people recognize that it's a really powerful form of curve fitting and it's something new. But in both cases, it's a really good way to guide your intuition, it really is curve fitting. So if you wanna fit a curve to data, you need data that spans all over the space that you wanna fit your curve to. So if all your data is clustered right around zero, you can only predict right around zero. If you try and go outside of that region, you have no data there, you have no idea what the right answer is. So you're gonna get it wrong. So you need to span very carefully the space that you wanna predict in. So that kind of goes to the wide data concept. And if you need something really accurate at some point, like close to the current climate, for example, you need a lot of data that's similar to the current climate so you can really resolve the curves in those areas. So that kind of says you also need the tall data. So you, it's good, probably good to combine them in a very nice balance sense, span your space and really resolve the stuff that you care about the most. There's also the concept of uh, boundary conditions. So you know when you're solving in dynamics or whatever, you have boundary conditions on your fluid dynamics solver. With these models, you also should probably be trying to do boundary conditions because when you go off the edge of your curve, you just extrapolate off into infinity, into space along some crazy straight line usually. So if you have any idea how your model should behave at very large distances from the parameters that you're looking at, you should throw a couple points in at the, the far edges in order to basically, if it's supposed to go to zero at infinity, throw in some zeros close to infinity so that you get the right boundary you know, asymptotic behavior. Another important idea is keeping track of the area that you've trained on. So if you've only trained in a certain area, you need to basically keep track of that boundary. It can be complicated because it's in a high dimensional space. So you can have internal boundaries as well as external boundaries. And you can do this by training a classifier to identify whether it's inside or outside of your training set. So the classifier or other detection technique kind of needs to go along with the training data so you know when you've strayed outside and you're now extrapolating rather than interpolating. So I think all these ideas are important together. The balanced training data set, detection of whether you're inside or outside of your training data, boundary conditions. Uh, I think these are all ideas that are evolving. People will have nailed down after a few more years of this. So maybe it's my machine learning bias, unconscious bias, when I heard um, Jed's question. But I thought by wide, he meant what dimension or how many features are in the data. And um, by that definition, the less wide you are, the easy it is, easier it is to be broad um, within that space. So if you're the, the higher dimensional space you're in, it'll be harder to have examples that really span the, the value combinations that are possible of those dimensions. Um, and I agree with David that we do want a diverse set of input data, but it's easier if you're sort of less wide and more tall, and, but that the tallness really explores the, the space that where the dimension of that space is 
is instantiated by the width. Um, but again, maybe there's too much machine learning jargon here. Um, and that's one thing we learn, like building interdisciplinary collaborations is, is terminology. There was a question. Yeah, Chris. Yes, this is probably more NWP than climate, um, but data assimilation and is, is, is a big issue and how you combine um, observations accurately uh, with, with model data uh, has a big impact in the performance of, ac of, of forecast skill. And it is a data problem because we're combining observation with model data. Uh, what, is there a role for machine learning there? Yeah, so I worked on a line of work that later I realized could be called data, assimila data assimilation in terms of the goal of data assimilation, not just because it was an ensemble Kalman filter, which it was not. Um, so we, we used um, AI algorithms to dynamically um, uh, provide a weighted average ensemble prediction. And this can be applied, I mean, we, we did it to an IPCC ensemble, but it can be applied to NWP ensembles. Um, and so we're incorporating the observation after each prediction epoch. So maybe each day all the models predict at the end of the day, we have the observation. And now based on how the models um, skill was with respect to that observation, we'll do a reweighting. Um, and the nice thing about these kinds of algorithms, I had previously been working more on the theory side where you would motivate this maybe by predicting the stock market, is that there's non-stationarity. So um, we want to learn the level of non temporal non-stationarity at the same time as learning how to update these weights because that'll inform your sort of model of the non-stationarity of the world will inform kind of your schedule for updating these weights. Um, and then we did extensions to um, tracking the non-stationarity over both time and latitude and longitude um, if we had uh, geographically explicit uh, projections from, from the ensemble. So now we'll have a weighting over the ensemble at each location, which the data that gets assimilated is also uh, geographically specific to that location. Um, so yeah, and then there've been a whole bunch of, of works, follow-up works, so this is an active area, trying to improve ensemble predictions um, in, in when, you're, when you're also allowed to use, to assimilate observations. I'd like to go in a, a couple of additional directions while we're talking about integrating observations with models. A few things uh, to think about there are fitting the difference between observation, observed quantities and modeled quantities. And there we can think about things like learning to build satellite emulators, for example, or various calibration problems. And there are a lot of ways as well in which, it's, in which we can think of a, a machine learning as something that can integrate both observed data and modeled data by learning the behavior of both or the differences between them. As one example of that, I'm currently working on a problem to build a surrogate model for the sea ice, the sea ice component of the Community Earth System model. And uh, the advantages of this surrogate model are that we can run it faster, which is good for sensitivity and uncertainty quantification studies and exploring the behavior of different parameterizations. And we can also compare it directly to observed sea ice cover data at specific data points that we don't necessarily have in the suite of original model simulations we've been able to run. So in this case, uh, going back to the curve fitting analogy, it's a little bit like having a, a high speed and convenient interpolation tool. On, on the data simulation front, well, the, uh, I know there's a lot of people who are interested in trying to put machine learning into data simulation, so I think there's a lot of opportunities there, especially with some of the limitations of some of our current, say like ENKF based systems that, that kind of have this linear Gaussian assumption built into it. Uh, like we're, I spent a lot of time at the University of Oklahoma where there's a lot of people interested in radar basically assimilating uh, super cell thunderstorms into numerical models and trying to 
trying to get the the radar representation into the model and, and they they keep having a lot of problems with it especially where the model will you'll get in get it, force it into the model but then like the, the storm into the model but then the storm doesn't it, the model kills the storm or weakens it or changes it in some material way. So there might be some way for a machine learning model because if it learns both the like model representation of the storm and the observed representation, maybe it can do a, a better nonlinear transform between the two uh, that, that may be more, that, that may pr result in less model rejection. There, there, I think there's potential there. There's, I'm sure there's a ton of challenges because now we're talking about trying to do 3D volumes of stuff and 2D is hard enough as it is so 3D it's another uh, dimension it's a whole other dimension of, uh, of data and complexity so so there's I think a lot of opportunities but it's probably going to be something that's going to take years and dedicated funding and efforts to to really get there so I work with a few groups that are working on data simulation um, Sid Bukabara's group at Noah Nesda Star is trying to do data simulation, and some of the guys in the JEDI Joint Center for Satellite Data Simulation are, are working on this. And they all have different ideas on how this can be done. Uh, I mean, so data simulation is often done in like 3D, 4D VAR with an iterative technique. And you can use deep learning in a straightforward way just to speed up the operators. The forward operator can go much, much faster. And therefore, you can do more data simulation in the same amount of time. So that's a very straightforward way to do it if you can do a good job of that. Another thing that you can do with deep learning that you couldn't do the old-fashioned way is potentially uh, model the inverse operator directly. So instead of iterating to get the inverse, you directly find a function that allows you to do the inverse. And you can do that from data uh, if you have you know, the right inputs and outputs and enough data. So that's another potential avenue. Some people are trying to speed up subcomponents of this process, uh, like directly predicting the Jacobians from the data rather than the operator. So just you know, when you're doing some of your, your adjoint steps, actually compute those using machine learning because they're, they're expensive and approximate to do manually. So there's really a lot of different um, approaches here. Another one that I've been thinking about is sort of um, using some of these other techniques like in-painting. I don't know if you've seen the NVIDIA in-painting demos, which are pretty fun. Basically, you can fill in missing data if you have other fields that basically are implicitly have the information in there. So you could imagine inputting your, uh, your last model state and lots of different observations. Uh, together with some sort of mask that tells where the data is good, where it's not, and then using an in-painting algorithm to automatically automatically construct the best possible state from those. So, an implicit data fusion technique, which might work well, but um, you know, I won't know until we try. Sorry, the the comments of David and Kelly uh, spurred some more ideas and hopefully pointers. Um, so yeah, let's broaden this question to when you have observation data and model data, what, what can you do? And I think one thing you may have been getting at is that this becomes a rich pl playground in terms of AI for latent variable models, especially interpretable models. So not deep learning, I'm talking about like probabilistic graphical models, Bayesian networks, where you're explicitly modeling variables of interest. Maybe it's the ENSO state, maybe it's, it's actually just some meteorological variable like temperature or something. Um, so what you can do is you can learn um, a data-driven uh, model from observations where for latent variables, from observations, you're not gonna know the ENSO state, so there are certain latent variables, um, and then compare them to physical models where um, there's actually explicit simulations for for some of those variables. Um, in terms of what the application would be for improving the model, um, I guess this would help with the design of emulators. It could also help with things like statistical downscaling. Um, so th those, are, those are some of the applications. Um, quick to, to, to piggyback on your comment, yes, machine learning is being used to solve inverse problems, um, for example, in medical imaging imaging because you can sample as much as you want from the dynamical system representing forward and so you can do uh, you do uh, learn a, a backwards model um, and finally I wanted to mention both the the uh, use of causal analysis from AI um, and 
call out a specific lab, M.A. Ebert Upoff at CSU at Colorado State University. And this was actually turning machine learning on its head, which is kind of cool, and saying, you know, usually you learn use machine learning because you want to predict, you want to forecast, you want to classify, um, or maybe you want to uh, generate um, generate samples similar to your training data, and we can talk about that later. Um, but she was actually learning machine learning models, interpretable Bayesian network models, and then looking at them. Um, to reason about some scientific question. Um, so for example, she would learn Bayesian networks and you can never prove that an edge is causal, but you can disprove that uh, a relationship is causal up to some tolerance or threshold using Hudea Pearls type of causality methods and groups at CMU, et cetera. And so she would run this experiment with important meteorological variables, um, you know, having to do with storm tracks and look over time and see which edges were persistent among variable relations and which ed edges had moved and thus conclude, you know, that storm tracks are moving northward in the nor northern hemisphere. This is corroborated by, by actually meteorological research, but this was a completely data-driven approach where you just looked at the resulting model. It's an interpretable model. And so the edges that persist over time have, have, an have a scientific interpretation. All right. So uh, unfortunately, we are all out of time for the formal panel. Um, but it, we, we'll have a break coming up. I hope uh, you all get a chance to um, talk with our panelists and continue this conversation uh, beyond the panel. Um, so let's thank our panelists. Thank you.